So we begin then in this first conference with a reflection on the passion of our Lord. And of course, we have heard or have read the story of the passion. It is read at Mass during Holy Week on Palm Sunday, and then Tuesday and Wednesday and Good Friday of Holy Week. We have the account of the passion according to the different evangelists. We have read in spiritual reading, perhaps, a book on the Passion, or have read meditation books. And unfortunately, it seems, given human nature, that sometimes the Passion of our Lord doesn't affect us as it should. Or we look at the crucifix, and we have crucifixes in our homes, and we see them every day. And so perhaps we don't think as deeply as we should about the Passion of our Lord. How can we understand it better? How can we more deeply enter into a union with our Lord, a reflection on his passion? I think one way is to imagine that you were there, just in your mind, go back 2,000 years, stand among the crowd to witness the various events of the passion. Try to paint a picture in your mind and reflect what it must have been like. And what is so amazing about the passion of our Lord is that as terrible as it was, as painful, as humiliating, as tormenting, as was the passion of our Lord, nevertheless, he desired it. At the beginning of the Last Supper, we read our Lord saying to the apostles, with desire, have I desired to eat this Pasch with you before I suffer? And before that, he had said, I have a baptism wherewith I am to be baptized. And how am I straightened until it be accomplished? The baptism, of course, meaning a baptism in his blood, shedding his blood in the Passion. But how am I straightened until it be accomplished? Like I'm constrained, I'm impatient that it come to pass. So why did our Lord go through such a terrible passion? Because we know, and the spiritual writers, theologians tell us, that Jesus, being divine, everything he did was done by a divine person and therefore infinite in value. Our Lord could have come into this world and simply offered a prayer to his Father, for the redemption of mankind. He could have shed one drop of blood. He could have done something much less painful and something very simple to redeem us. And that one drop of blood or one prayer would have been infinite in value and therefore would have been adequate and more than adequate to reopen the gates of heaven, to redeem fallen men. But it would not have satisfied his love. And this is indeed a mystery. That God loves us so much. Because we read in the Catechism about God, about his perfections. And one of the things I'm always careful to teach the children is that God doesn't need us. Almighty God the Catechism tells us, created the world. Why? Why did he create us and the world about us? And the Catechism puts it very well. To show forth his goodness and to share with us his everlasting happiness in heaven. But when souls are lost, human beings reject God and his will and lose their souls it doesn't cause God to lose his happiness because God is perfect. In fact, we could say that's why God the Son came into the world and assumed a human nature, to be able to suffer, to be able to feel sorrow, to unite with us, to experience, we might say, the human condition. So getting back to why did our Lord not just simply offer one prayer, 
shed one drop of blood, it would have been abundantly adequate to save us, but it would not have satisfied his love. His love is so great beyond our ability to comprehend. And as some of the saints would say, looking upon the crucifix, they would address our Lord as, O oh, love, love, calling our Lord love, because indeed he is filled with love of us. So again, God is perfect. We cannot take away, nor can we really add to God's happiness, because if we could add to his happiness then it would be incomplete right now. And God is perfect. But in his goodness, he wishes to share with us his happiness. Because you see, goodness is expansive. If someone is good, that goodness grows out to others, wants to share with others, wants to help others, wants to be kind to others. That's what goodness is, what it does, how it affects a person. And God, who is supremely good, wanted to create other beings and to share with them his happiness. But Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God's command and they fell. And not only did they fall, but by their fall, they put their entire descendants into this fallen state. Every one of their children and descendants, with one lone exception, of course, our Blessed Mother, the Immaculate Conception. But look at what we lost through the sin of Adam and Eve, those preternatural gifts that God had bestowed upon them and which he had intended be passed down to their descendants. And those wonderful gifts were, first and foremost, his own friendship. Adam and, Adam and Eve, before their sin, enjoyed a friendship with God, a, a union with him. They also had freedom from any kind of sickness or suffering or death. They had great knowledge. And they also had a complete integrity a preservation from what we know as concupiscence, a fallen human nature. They had no knowledge of that. In fact, when Satan tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, he said, why? Why did God tell you you can't eat this fruit? And this is when Eve began to waver. She said, well, perhaps we will die. God said that perhaps we shall die. And Satan said, no, you won't die. The reason why God doesn't want you to eat the fruit of this tree is because he knows that if you eat it, you will be like him. You will know good and evil. Now, note the deception of the devil because in every lie to be effective, there's some truth. And actually, what he said was partially at least true. They did not know evil before they ate the forbidden fruit. They had only known good. And now their eyes were opened and they understood and they experienced and they knew evil. And here we are with, born into this world with the sin of Adam and Eve, the original sin on our soul. But thanks be to God with baptism. That sin was washed away, yet the effects of original sin remain. And that is our trial in this life, fighting against temptation, experiencing suffering and illness and eventually death, but especially that daily fight against our fallen human nature. And yet, if we reflect upon that struggle, we can realize that it also is our opportunity to gain merit, to sanctify ourselves, to give honor and glory to God, to earn a place in heaven by fighting the good fight, by overcoming temptation. So temptation, as dangerous as it is, is an opportunity for good. 
You know the old saying that to bring good out of evil. So God permits us to be tempted. But in his goodness, he gives us all of the means necessary if we make use of them. These wonderful means of grace are available to us. Now let us get back to a reflection on the passion of our Lord, the terrible sufferings, and then we ask the question, why? Why did Jesus suffer so much? It all goes back to one word, and that word is sin. Had there been no sin, there would have been no passion. I mentioned earlier that our Lord suffered so much because of his love for us, to show his love. But also, had he just simply said a prayer for our redemption or shed one little drop of blood, it would not have expressed to us the enormity of sin. It would not have impressed on our minds the evil of sin. And so when we look at the Passion, we pray the stations of the cross, we look at the crucifix, we meditate upon the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, or simply read about the Passion, what should particularly strike us is this is the price of sin. This is the cost of sin, the terrible sufferings and death of our Lord. Had there been no sin, there would have been no passion. Now in today's epistle and gospel, we have a mention of sin in both and the evil of sin and the importance of amendment of life. In the epistle, we have that virtuous woman of the Old Testament found in the book of Daniel the prophet, Susanna. And Susanna had been falsely accused of sin by these iniquitous judges, these two men. And they tried to tempt her into sin, and she said, and I'm paraphrasing, it would be better for me to fall into your hands, meaning to be put to death, rather than to commit sin. She knew that God is everywhere, and so she would not consent to sin with them, and she would rather be unjustly put to death rather than offend God by that sin. And then in the gospel, we read that story of the woman caught in adultery who was going to be stoned to death. And the Pharisees thought they had a chance to finally trap our Lord and condemn him. When they asked him, Moses said, we should stone such a person. But what do you say? They knew that our Lord had established himself as someone even above Moses, whom they so highly respected. Our Lord often had said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or whatever the law was. But I say to you, so he taught the gospel, a higher way of life. And now they thought they could trap him by saying, well, Moses said this, but what do you say? Because they knew our Lord had come to forgive and to convert sinners and that he loved repentant sinners. And our Lord just simply said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. So they felt ashamed and they left. And once again, he beat them at their own game. But what did he say to the woman after everyone had melted away, the crowd disappeared? Go and sin no more. No more. Yam amplius noli pecari. Do not sin anymore. And this is what we should especially reflect upon during Lent. If we ask ourselves, what's the theme of Lent? Or the themes of the liturgy of the spirit of Holy Mother Church. Well, reflection on the passion of our Lord, fasting and penance to atone for sin, but especially Lent is a time for conversion. Spiritual conversion, what does the word conversion mean? 
It comes from the Latin to turn. To turn to Almighty God. To turn away from sin and to turn to Almighty God. That's what Lent really is all about. We could spend some time in wonderful spiritual reading and reflection and even perform a number of penitential practices. But if we do not practice the amendment of life, then we're missing the spirit of Lent, what it is really all about. What is amendment? A change for the better. To cease committing sin. And this is so important to remember because human nature being what it is, and what I mean by that is that we can so often think only of what we see, the externals. We tend to judge which we shouldn't judge others anyway, but we tend to judge, oh, this person is a very devout Catholic, or he or she, look, is so devout, prays the rosary, prays extra prayers, spends extra time in church, and all of that is good. But what is especially important? To conquer sin. There may be a soul that does not seem to us to be so spiritual, Someone who perhaps doesn't seem to be as pious, maybe doesn't spend as much time in prayer as we or others, but may be far more pleasing to God than I, because here is a soul who has conquered sin and is living a life of virtue and trying to overcome even venial sin. That is what we should keep in mind. God looks upon the heart. And what he especially wants to see in us is not just holy thoughts, good feelings, spiritual ideas, but a sinless heart. That is what real Christianity is all about. Overcoming sin. Go and sin no more. So let's take a minute to reflect upon sin, what it is, and the evil of sin. So we begin with a definition. We could say sin is nothing more nor less than a violation of one of God's laws. Another definition would be sin is turning one's back upon God. Sin is offending Almighty God, displeasing Almighty God. Now, when it comes to mortal sin and venial sin, we are speaking of a complete difference. As it were, two different species. Two different things entirely. For it is only mortal sin that can lead a soul to hell. The devil cannot take you to hell. No one else can cause you to lose your soul. The only thing is that will lead a soul to hell is the person misusing his or her free will and choosing sin and dying in that state. Committing mortal sin, because sin is an act of the will. Where the will has no control, there can be no sin. It is a person taking his free will and using it to choose to reject God, to to violate his laws, to turn again one's back on Almighty God. And we should have a hatred of sin, a horror of sin, You read about how in the old days, in the Middle Ages, and at the time of our Lord, there was this disease called leprosy, and how people dreaded leprosy because they didn't want to contract it themselves. I even remember reading that in the Middle Ages, there was a a ceremony where someone who had leprosy had to live outside the village, outside the town, and they had in the church a sort of requiem mass, like the person is already dead, at least dead to society, can no longer participate visiting people in their homes, going to public places, and so forth. It was looked upon as as death, as it were. What a dread people had for leprosy. Do we have that same kind of dread for sin? Do we recoil at the presence of sin? Do we flee from the occasions of sin? 
And do we repent sincerely of having committed sin? So this is something I would say during Lent should be at the top of your list to accomplish. A greater horror of sin, a greater understanding of what a terrible evil it is. And when we look at our Lord in his passion, we reflect upon the passion, that should be primarily the result. An understanding of the evil of sin. I'd like to read to you a section that's a bit lengthy from a meditation book on sin. And so the first section will be on mortal sin. When we reflect on the terrors of hell, and when we call to mind that those who are suffering such incredible torments there were the children of God, his well-beloved, for whom he had given the whole of his blood, and that a single mortal sin, converting such ineffable love into such implacable anger, will make the whole weight of his divine vengeance weigh them down throughout eternity. We are seized with stupor, and we exclaim, Oh, how much, then, does mortal sin displease thee, O my God? And with what hatred dost thou pursue it? If from hell... We raise our thoughts to heaven. What do we see? Empty places which were formerly occupied by angels, pure spirits shining with admirable beauty, clothed with the most magnificent perfections, masterpieces of the hand of God. A day comes when they allow themselves to indulge in a proud thought. At that very moment, God pronounces against them a terrible sentence. But, O Lord, if thou wouldst grant them pardon, they would praise thee throughout eternity. If thou wilt cast them into hell, they will blaspheme thee everlastingly and will drag down to eternal damnation millions of men. It does not signify, let them fall into the bottom of the abyss. But they have only committed one single sin. It is their first sin. And after all, it is only a sinful thought. It does not signify, let them fall into the bottom of the abyss. O holiness of my God, how pitiless is thy hatred of sin. But if thou dost punish the officers of thy court, what ought not I to fear? I, the last of thy servants, guilty of a thousand treasons, I who have sinned not only once, and in thought, but millions of times and in all my senses, all the members of my body, in all the powers of my soul, and against the majority of thy commandments. That is taken from the writings of St. Bernard. From heaven, thus depopulated of a portion of its inhabitants, I descend to the terrestrial paradise, and I see there the place which Adam occupied when he was innocent, A day came when he had the misfortune of yielding to an intemperance, which seems apparently very slight. He ate a certain fruit which God had forbidden him, and immediately he lost all the grace of his first state. He was condemned to all kinds of evils, even to death, and not only he, but all his posterity, all men down to the end of the world will be a prey to innumerable miseries, to war, to pestilence, to famine, to murders, to tempests, to ignorance, to concupiscence. Nay, every one of them would have been damned if the entirely gratuitous mercy of God had not redeemed us. Great God, how many punishments of one at one and the same time for a single sin. And if one single sin displeased thee, to such a degree as to make thee resolve to visit the world with so many calamities, what will be the consequence of my innumerable sins? Can I ever weep enough for them and conceive a sufficiently lively contrition for them? Nevertheless, my God, it is not even in these things that is shown in all its intensity the horror which thou hast for sin. 
I take my crucifix in my hand, and I say to myself, He whose image I contemplate was the only and well-beloved Son of God. He was God, but because he took upon himself the semblance of sin, his heavenly Father launched upon his head all the weight of his anger. He delivered him up to the most cruel of torments, the most terrible ignominy, to death and death upon the cross. O sin, how horrible thou art in the sight of God! How I ought to regret and to weep over the evil I committed in allowing thee to enter into my heart. If, for the mere semblance of sin, God thus treated his only Son, how, for so many real sins, will he treat a rebel and contemptible subject like me? If wood that was green had to pass through such a furnace, what will I be? What will it be with dry wood, which is ready to be consumed by fire? Behold here the most powerful of motives for weeping over sin and conceiving a better contrition for it. So this should be one of the graces of Lent, is a greater hatred of sin. Yes, we all hate sin. We know what it is. We know that one mortal sin could cause the loss of our soul forever. We dread it. We avoid the occasions of sin, but maybe not as much as we should. Maybe we toy with temptations. We don't flee as quickly, as promptly, as thoroughly as we should from danger. Yesterday was the feast day of St. Dominic Savio. What a wonderful saint. The youngest confessor ever canonized, meaning a male saint who was not a martyr. And St. Dominic Savio became a saint because he lived his motto. And what was his motto? Death rather than sin. We all should take that motto of the young Dominic Savio to heart. I believe he was a couple weeks shy of his 15th birthday. Not even quite 15. And here he is a canonized saint because he lived that motto, death rather than sin. The other story about that is told of a saint, King Louis IX, a wonderful king in France in the 13th century who was so considerate of all his subjects, of the poor, of every aspect, every need of his subjects, who went on a couple of crusades to the Holy Land and lived such a virtuous life. But we go back to his childhood. And his saintly mother said to him when he was a little child, I would rather see you dead than to know you committed a mortal sin. And that thought so impressed him, that early training from his good Catholic mother so deeply impressed him that it is said he never did commit a mortal sin and, of course, is a canonized saint. So let us take that motto to heart, death rather than sin, and pray during Lent, for a contempt of sin, a hatred of sin, a horror of sin, and to do everything we can to avoid it. Now I want to read another section from this same meditation book here, and this is on venial sin. Because sin is sin, and yes, mortal sin is something altogether different, but venial sin also offends God. And if we love him, we will not want to offend him even by venial sin. God hates venial sin so much that in the next life, he visits it with chastisements, which during almost an eternity are a kind of hell. And he keeps the gates of his paradise closed against souls, which are his friends and are dear to him until the complete expiation of the least of their sins. Now, of course, it is referring to purgatory. And we know from the revelations to the saints, departed souls who appeared asking for prayers, 
that there can be souls in purgatory who are there for many, many years, even hundreds of years. Such is the need to expiate venial sin. The author goes on, speaking of God, he hates it so much that even in this life, he has often visited it, venial sin, with terrible chastisements. The wife of Lot permitted herself to indulge in thoughtless curiosity. At that very instant, she is struck dead. He was turned into a pillar of salt, not for committing a mortal sin, but a venial sin, disobeying God's command and out of curiosity, turning and looking back. Another example, a man was discovered picking up a little wood on the Sabbath day, and God commanded them to stone him and let him die. From the book of Numbers, chapter 15. Moses, that holy man Moses, indulged in a little mistrust of God. He struck the rock twice. He is not allowed to enter the promised land, which he had deserved to see by 40 years of service. A prophet, through complacence, remains a little longer than necessary in the place in which he had been sent. A lion comes out of the forest and devours him. Third book of Kings chapter 13. And one last example from the Old Testament. David, animated by secret vanity, causes his people to be numbered. Seventy thousand of them die of the pestilence. And that is considered by theologians to have been a venial sin. David, who reigned for 40 years after bringing about a complete peace throughout his kingdom, the borders of the kingdom had been extended the farthest they had ever been and were secure, and everyone was living in peace and security. And out of vanity, he said to his courtiers, I would like a census taken of my entire kingdom. And they did everything they could to dissuade him. They said, King David, you have so many subjects, thousands of subjects. Why do you need to know the exact number? It will be very difficult for us. It will be very expensive. It will require a lot of people and time to send an agent to every corner of your kingdom to take a census. He didn't listen to their advice. And he commanded the census to be taken. And that was done. And God was displeased and sent a plague that cost the life of 70,000 of his subjects as a punishment for that venial sin of vanity on his part. So let us be careful not to have the attitude, well, it's only a venial sin. Because if we look at the passion of our Lord and what he suffered, yes, primarily it was because of mortal sin. But venial sin also displeases him. And if not fully expiated in this life, will cause us to spend perhaps a great deal of time in purgatory. Let us then strive to avoid all sin. Make your examination of conscience carefully each night and ask yourself, how have I offended God this day? And then resolving to amend and to do your best to avoid even every venial sin. Let us then take to heart the words of our Lord in today's gospel to the woman taken in adultery. Go and sin no more. May this year's Lent be for us a time of true conversion, turning away from sin, turning completely to God, to God who so loved us as to come down into this world and lay down his life in such pain, such suffering, because of the evil of sin, so that we could be saved. Let us kneel in reflection.